So uh, we are moving uh, the gear uh, now to uh, chapter two, which will cover uh, in this uh, chapter the details of the language of the computers, how we can write instructions, the assembly language, and all of these kind of stuff. So this instruction set is basically like the basics of the uh, instructions or uh, the language of the computer, as we will see shortly. And of course, different computers will have different instructions. As I told you earlier, that different, different, we have different languages, correct? That we can talk to each other with. The computers also have different languages, and this is basically the instruction set. Of course, uh, the early computers have like simple instruction sets, simplified implementation, and with, of course, uh, the time is going, it's just like evolving and the changing the instruction and so on and so forth. So before we dig in uh, into the details uh, of uh, the instructions, let's cover a little bit some of the basic uh, uh, explanations before we move forward. One of the basic implementation of the information that we need to remind you with, that basically the bit is the most basic unit of information in a computer. And this bit can be, as an example, on or off, or high or low, or zero, or one. I can may refer to one as on and zero as off, or maybe the other way around. It's according to whatever like we, I will agree or I will design my CPU or my circuit or my design on that particular things because zero or one is just logic. But just for your reference, and this is like not part of the course, but just for your reference, that at the very end, if you look at that, is not but I have a certain particular voltage input as an example or particular voltage that represents that particular bit. So for instance, assuming that you have a circuit that's zero, uh, to five volts. So an easy explanation that I might say that zero volt will be represented as logic zero and five volt will be represented as logic one, correct? But a question might pop up in your mind saying that, okay, I understand if it is five volt, I will refer to that as logic one. And if it is zero volt, I will refer to that as logic zero. But how about if it is three volts? How about if it is 2.8 volts? How about if it is 1.5 volts? How I would represent these things? Generally, designers usually put a margin. For instance, they might say from three and above will be represented as one. From two and below will be represented as zero. And from two and three, this is just like a gap that is undefined. And if I have a voltage in that gap, I won't be able to present it either zero and ones, and I have to reset my circuits, for instance. Or I may design my circuits differently and so on and so forth. But at the very end, I have to put like a margin or a sharp uh, uh, line between that and the other one, just logically. But this out of the scope of our class. We are not going on that particular de de details. This is just for your own information. So here I can represent the zeros and ones, and as I mentioned, can be on or off. So this bit can be either or zero or ones. And the zeros and ones is just a way that the computer or the machine will interpret the information as we will see shortly. There is also another important expression that we need to highlight that's called byte. And byte is not but a group of eight bits. So if I have eight bits collected together, this is not but something called byte. So I have eight bits and this will be called byte. Another important information we would like to highlight for what is a, whatever that is called byte, that a byte is the smallest possible addressable unit of computer storage. What does that mean? The next question that should come to your mind, what does that mean? What does that, what is mean, what is meant by smallest possible addressable unit? Let's take an example. 
assuming that we have a certain street and in that street we have houses okay and of course you would expect that each house has a certain address that's correct yes and if i'm asking you what is the smallest addressable unit in that particular street your answer should be a house because basically you cannot address a room inside that house you cannot send a mail to a certain room inside that house that will go only to that particular room instead of the other room you won't be able to do that so the smallest addressable unit in that street is the house assuming that you have another street that actually has buildings and in these building in these buildings you have apartments and then i'm asking you what is the smallest units or what is the smallest addressable units that you can have of course your answer will be in that case apartments because basically in your mail you can write the address of the building but also you can write the apartment number or the apartment letter or whatever then you can send the mail to the building and to the apartment but again you cannot address a room in another place that has maybe like dorms or have like something even more specific specifically specified than just that you might have buildings and you have apartments and inside the apartments you have room numbers and in that case you can actually address a room number you can send the mail to a certain room number in that particular case the smallest addressable unit is the room but you cannot address beds if inside the room there are three beds there are there is three beds there are three beds you cannot say like to bed zero bed one and so on and so forth correct and as you have seen from these examples, the smallest addressable unit is different. In our case, and in our class, we will just take the byte as the smallest addressable unit. Meaning that I can address a byte. I can send you, send information or take information, or I can address a byte. I can say this is byte zero. This is byte one. This is byte two. But I can't address a bit. I can't say go to bit three in byte zero and grab it. I won't be able to do that. And that's that is the meaning behind smallest possible addressable unit. And this term addressable is just as we have explained. So with the MIPS instruction set throughout the course you can basically check this particular link it's in stanford mips commercialized uh, by mips technologies for more information please visit this link and this is basically has a large share of embedded core market and typical of many modern instruction set architectures that actually is using the maps that we are covering in this class just as a reminder, install Mars in your laptop. Keep track of course updates on Canvas. Make sure you have a CSE account. If you have any comments about the lab account, hardware system and so on, please contact the help desk at cse.psu.edu. For any questions about the programming assignments, reach out to the TAs of the course. Another important thing we would like to highlight is basically the memory organization. So the memory consists, of course, of many millions of cells, and each cell will hold a certain bit. And each of these, as an example, let's say like rows in rows, each of these row inside my memory will hold a certain particular data here a bit and bit and bit and bit and so on and so forth all the bits will be included here so we have defined the bits we have defined the byte which is eight bits but also we will define another thing that is called word which is a group of n bits 
What is that n? n can be anything from 16 to 64. What does that mean? This means that actually in some systems, 16 bits can be combined together and we can call this as a word. In another system, we can combine 32 bits and we will call or refer to this as a word. In other systems, we can combine 64 bits and we will refer to that as a word. Now that's very confusing. Yeah, I agree. But the good thing that in this course, we will stick to the word as 32 bits by default unless otherwise specified in the exam or in the quiz. By default, you should assume that the word is 32 bits. And the memory is just the collections of this word. So I have this as an example, my first word, second word, third word, fourth word, and so on and so forth. I'm concatenating all of these words. I am generating the memory. So as you can see from here, this is my word. It is 32 bits in my case. It can be any other number of bits, as I told you of these examples, either 16 or 64. In my case, it is 32 bits. I, this is, will be my first word, second word, and so on and so forth, until the last word, and this, I'm building my memory. In this memory, I will save some of the information. I should be able to access this information according to some particular rules, as we will explain later on. But also we would like to understand <clears throat> that I can allocate the memory dif in different ways. Assuming that I didn't design the hardware yet for whatever reason, or I just would like just to make theoretically changes that assuming that I have 96 bit memory, meaning I have a memory that can, can save up to 96 bits. If this is the case, and I'm telling you that the width of my memory is just eight bits. How many rows should I have in this particular memory? Of course, in this case, I have from zero all the way to 11, meaning 12 rows, because 12 multiplied by eight is equal to 20, 96. 12 is basically the rows, and eight is basically the eight bits width of my memory. But if I'm telling you that actually you have 12 bits width. Your memory can take up to 12 bits in each of these rows. Again, by the same concept, you will have now from zero to seven rows, eight rows, and eight multiplied by 12 is also equal to 96 as 12 is the, is the uh, width and eight now is the number of rows. If I'm telling you that this actually the width of my memory is 16 bits, in that case, I will have from zero to five. So I have six different rows. So six multiplied by 16 is also equal to 96. So I have seen now that I can actually organize my 96 bits differently, as you can see here. The total is still the same, but how I'm allocating them is a little bit different. But again, just to remind you that by, by default in our class, we will have a one row with one word as a word, which is 32 bits. But the good thing that I can address each byte in that particular word, as an example. So the word will be 32 bits. And if the word is 32 bits, and I'm choosing, choosing my width in the memory as eight bits, so this means that from zero, one, two, three will be the first word. From four, five, six, seven will be the second word and so on and so forth. So I'm counting zero, four, and then eight, and then 12 and so on and so forth. Because I can count a byte, as I told you earlier. Although I have a one word, 32 bits, but I can count a byte inside that word. I can tell you, please go to byte zero and bring it to me, as an example. Or I can refer to this particular word as just address zero. 
and I can refer to this particular word as address four, since it begins at address four. Bring me that word that begins at address four. Bring to me that word that begins at address zero, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> But also, I just would like to highlight another thing that in these 32 bits wording, I can store the 32 bits as a signed integer or basically four eight bits as an ASCII character. So in that case, if it is signed integer, bit 31 will be the signed bit in this case. Look at this. So I have here my word from bit zero to bit 31. If I have a sign integer, I will refer to this bit 31 as the sign bit. If it is zero, it is positive number. If it is one, that gives me an indication that it is a negative number. But also, <clears throat> this word, which is 32 bits again, I can look at this a little bit differently, meaning that the first eight bits will correspond to a certain ASCII character, second eight bits will refer to another ASCII character, and so on and so forth. So that gives you an indication that I can write the bits, which are exactly the same bits as an example, but I can represent or interpret these bits differently. If it is signed, if it is unsigned, if it is uh, ASCII character or not, and so on and so forth. It's exactly the same kind of things as in language. I can lie, write a Latin letter, but I can tell you that this is language A, this is language B, this is language C, and so on and so forth. And as soon as, soon as you will know the language, you will pronounce the same letter differently, which means that you are interpreting the same letter differently or maybe the same word differently and so on and so forth. It is exactly the same thing. There is also another important thing. To store or retrieve, item, or retrieve, retrieve items of uh, information, each memory location has a distinct address. And the numbers from zero to two to the power of K minus one are used as address for successive locations in the memory. What does that mean? Let's take just a normal example from our life as a decimal instead of binary. It's because we have uh, uh, numbers that has a base of 10. We can count as a base of uh, uh, two, or we can count as a base of six or base of eight and so on and so forth. We have seen binary, hexadecimal, octal, and decimal, correct? I'm assuming that you already knew this information. Let's say we are used to do this counting in decimal, and I'm giving you two numbers, two digits in decimal, and I'm asking you what, what is the maximum number of addresses that actually we can use or we can address with these two numbers, with these two digits. You have only two digits and you would like to address a certain houses in a certain street, I'm telling you how many houses can you have in that particular street, given that you can use only two digits to address these houses. The answer will be, the first house can be zero, zero, the second will be zero, one, two, three, four, all the way till 99. So you can count from zero, zero, all the way to address house 99, correct? So this means that you can address 100 houses, correct? You can address 100 houses in that street given that you have only two digits and given that it is decimal. Because in decimal, you can count till nine and you can have 99. How did you know that I can actually count 100? Because I can count from zero all the way to 10 to the power of k minus one. What is k? Is the number of digits that you are already given. In this case, I have two digits. So I can count from zero all the way to 10 to the power 
of k minus one, which gives me an indication that I have 10 to the power of k different options. What is k? It's the number of digits that I have. In this case, if I have two digits, 10 to the power of two is 100. So I can count from zero all the way to 100 minus one to 99. So I can count from zero to 99, correct? Why it is 10? Because I am working with a decimal which has a base of 10. The same question exactly I'm giving to you, but you don't have a base of 10. You have a base of two, you have a binary number. And I'm asking you the same exact question. What is the maximum number of addresses that you can actually address these houses, given that you have only a binary number? Binary number means that you have zero or one. So if I'm giving you a two digits, you can count the first as zero, zero, second as zero, one, the third as one, zero, the last one as one, one. How many options? Four. How did you do that? Applying the same rule. It is from zero all the way to the my base to the power of K as K is the number of bits minus one. So I can count from zero all the way to three because one, one actually is three. So I have two to the K different options, which is two to the power of three, four, to the power of two, four. So I have four different options, correct? So if I have an address, Sorry, if I have a memory, and then I have, I have two bits, for instance, to address this memory, then I can have only address four location. And this will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. But if I have three bits, things will be changed because I have now two to the power of three, yes, eight. So I can go from zero all to the way to the two to the power of three minus one from zero to seven. And then I can address more and so on and so forth. If I have 20 bits, I can address two to the power of 20, which is one meg. If I have 32 bits, I can count or address two to the power of 32, which is basically four gig locations. I just would like to highlight an interesting thing here before we move forward. A while ago, we had machines that actually 32 bits based. And since it was 32 bits only, this means that it can address, as you can see here, and as you just learned it, two to the power of 32 different locations inside my memory, correct? And since the maximum is four gig, so if I have a memory, I can address each of these locations, the maximum, is four gig, this gives me an indication that the maximum memory that I can buy or I can address is basically four gig. And that's why we have spent some time a while ago that the maximum RAM that we can get used of or get benefit of is basically four gig only. And anything more than the four gig I can't address because I only have 32 bits. More than that, I don't have the numbers. Before the idea of virtual machine, addressing virtual machine, and before the idea or the implementation that actually we had 64 bits. Now, because we have 64 bits, we can have, we don't have this limitation at all because we can address huge amount of addresses right now, two to the power of 64. And we no longer have this four gig limitation because we have more bits to add the small locations inside my memory. And that's why I can, as you can see, I have, I can buy like more and more and more of these RAM sizes. Okay. But again, as we mentioned, <clears throat> that I can address actually a byte. So the byte size is always eight bits. And inside my word, assuming that this is my word, and it is 32 bits. And then inside this, I have bytes, and each byte has eight bits. So this means that I have four bytes, correct? Because 32 
divide by eight bits will give me four different bytes. But I told you that I can address the bytes. I can address them. I can say that this is byte zero, byte one, byte two, byte three. So I can address the bytes inside the same world. I have this accessibility. But the question that you need to ask, or you should think of, or I'm expecting that, why did you count from the left, not from the right? Meaning that why you didn't call that this byte is zero, this byte is one, this byte is two, this byte is three. I agree with you that actually we can count from the left or we can count from the right. That's fine. The most important thing that you have to let me know which one you are counting with. Or if we are working with a certain system, we need to know in advance which one they are following. So I can build my code in assembly or I can build my whatever design accordingly. Or maybe we will have a company that actually we will choose how we are addressing my bytes. Will we begin from the left or we would be begin from the right? And then we have agreed that this is whatever we are following. And this gives us an indication why we have what is called big and little Indian addressing. Basically, the big Indian is addressing assigns lower addresses to more significant bytes, while little Indians is the other way around. So what does that mean? In little Indian machines, the least significant byte is followed by the most significant byte. But in big Indian machines, it's actually the other way around. They store the most significant byte first. This is not, but I just, as I just told you, one will count from the left and one will count from the right. So if I have a big Indian, it will count from the left. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on and so forth. If I have a little Indian, it is zero, one from the right, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on and so forth. But in both cases, either big Indian or little Indian, the first word will begin with the byte zero. The second word will begin with byte four. I would expect that to count by four always because I have in each word four bytes, eight, 12, and so on and so forth. The same here, byte zero here, byte four, eight, 12, and so on and so forth. I can refer to the word, the first word with address zero. The second word begin at address four. So if I'm telling you go and bring the first word, I can tell you go to the address zero and then bring everything. It will just bring the whole world. If I'm telling you go to address four, it will go to address four and bring the whole world. If I'm telling you address four, it will go four and bring the whole world and so on and so forth. So now we know that there is a big Indian and little Indian. Let's take that example. Assuming that you have a hexadecimal number like that, and I'm telling you, please address that in big Indian or little Indian. So now you have the word. And since this is hexadecimal, so two of these things will represent a byte, and then a byte, and then a byte, and then a byte. The question is, will I put this byte here first, or I will put this byte here first? Meaning, should I put here 12, and then 34, and then 56, and then 78? Or will I put here 12 first, and then 34 here, and then 56 here, and then 78 here. This is, is just the difference between big Indian and little Indian. We mentioned that with big Indian, we will count from the left. So basically here is zero, here is one, here is two, here is three. If little Indian, I will, I will count from the right. This is by zero, by one, by two, by three. And we are applying the exact same rules that we just learned.
either I'm counting from the right or I'm counting from the left. And this is the same word. But which one will have a certain address? But all of these addresses is still in a one word. Let's this take the same example. I'm telling you, please put this in a little Indian order and I'm giving you the same number. Since little Indian, we are counting from the right, yes? So the first two will be address zero. The second two will be address one. The next will be address two. The next will be address three. And the in binary zero is written as zero, zero. This is written as zero, one. This is written as one, zero. And this written as one, one. So basically in the 78 will be with address zero, as you can see from here, 56 will be with address one, 34 will be with address one, zero, one, two will be with address three, which is one, one. So another important thing is that also we need to highlight that is what's called the word alignment. Meaning that word locations have aligned addresses if they begin a byte addresses that are multiples of the number of bytes in a word. If I have two bytes per word, of course, I would expect zero, two, four, and so on and so forth. If I have eight bytes per word, I would expect the address would be zero, eight, 16. If I have four bytes per word, I would expect it to be zero, four, eight, as we mentioned in our example, correct? So what does that mean if it is alignment or aligned or not? In this case, I have my word, all of this word in one address, it, and it should be aligned in this case. But in another example, I might have that some of my words are in certain address, which is it. Another part is in 16, and in that case, it's not aligned. However, in this course, we will assume always that it's basically it is aligned. unless otherwise specified. <clears throat> and it will look something like that, for instance. Another things that we would like to highlight for memory operations, meaning that what kind of operation I can do with the memory. Interestingly, in our case, we can read from the memory or write to the memory. So if I have my memory like that, with several locations, I can actually read from the memory or retrieve information from the memory or write to the memory. I can do these kind of things uh, 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 basically here. But of course, we need to know like how we will be able to do that and if we have some limitations or not. And that's why we need to know, of course, the instruction set architecture, all the instructions that I can use for a certain computers. But just like as a rule of thumb, instructions for a certain computer must support a data transfers to and from the memory, arithmetic and logic operation that I need to do, program sequencing and the control, and then input and output transfer. I, I can tell you like in any language, it has to have like nouns, verbs, maybe adjectives, adverbs, and so on and so forth. And then you can begin to build your own language. But there is like a minimum, minimum things that you can actually satisfy. And accordingly, we need to deep, uh, go deep a little bit or dive in to understand more on how actually we can begin to interact with the memory and the registers and so on and so forth through a register transfer notation. Let's take that example. I have something called R2. I have an arrow, and then I have LOC refer to location. And when I see this, I should understand that I am transferring a certain location from my memory to something called R2, which is a register inside my CPU or a register location inside a CPU. To understand this in more details, let's take that particular example. This is my memory, for instance. So this is my memory. And here is my register.
And I would like to copy an information that is basically inside the memory to a register. Let's say that this register, the first register is called R0, word also, the size is 32 bits. This register is called R1, this register is called R2, R3, and so on and so forth. And I would like to copy particular location, let's say that one, to R2. So whatever the information that I have here, or the word that I have here, I need actually to copy it to that place. How I can do that? First, I have to mention from where I should retrieve the information. And that's why I have to specify a certain location. And this basically will be a certain location. So I'm telling you, go to that particular address or location, bring the stuff that is inside that location, please copy that to that particular register number. As R2 is basically the address of that particular register. And location is not but the address. Let's say I will give you like address 12. So this means that this is basically 12 here. Go to address 12, bring that word, copy it to register number two. Please go to that house number, bring whatever like I'm telling, whatever is there, they will give you something bring it to the other location called register two. Remember that in the memory here, you just to know the location. You don't know what is the information here. If I'm asking you what is the word that is inside this, you don't have any idea about what is exactly there. What you know is the location. Blindly, you will go there, take that, whatever is inside that location, retrieve it and copy in the register R2 location. This is what you need to do. That's all. Okay, that's fine. We understand that. Let's take another example that actually can do other operation. R4 and then R2 plus R3. What does that mean? This means that we have a register here. Again, R0. R1, R2, R3, R4, and so on and so forth. I am telling you, go to R2, go to this, and go to R3, go to this. Please retrieve the information that is inside, add them, put the result in R4. This is what I'm telling you. And that's all. So we have agreed now that as soon as you will see a syntax like that, you will understand that this is my destination and this is my two places that I will retrieve the information from and then do a certain operation that is called here add addition and then we'll put the results in that particular location. Correct? So now we have understood we have understood two things, that I can actually retrieve information from the memory and copy it to a certain particular location in the register. And by the way, as we will see just shortly that we can do the other way around, meaning that we can actually move information from the register or copy information from the register to a certain particular location inside the memory also. Or this example, which I have been able to do a certain arithmetic operation inside my register. Okay, let's dive a little bit more inside these details. Now let's say that we have an assembly language instruction with this particular syntax. It's called LW R2 comma lock. What does that mean? Let's say that we have again the memory here my memory. And here my register. And I'm telling you LW means 
load word from this location, which let's say lock here, which refer to a certain location inside my memory. Of course, I will give you a certain number, yes? And that number is referred to a certain particular location. Please load the word that is here in that particular location, copy it in location R2. Copy it here. This means that guy. Load word from location, certain location in the memory to R2, which is in the register. Okay, so we did understand now a new syntax. We can also have add R4, comma R2, comma R3. This means that I can take the values that is basically in R3 or the word that is in R3. And then whatever I have in R2, add the information together and then put the result in R4, and this is basically the things, add R4, comma R2, R3. So I will take this, addition to that, put the results in R4. So now we have agreed now to a certain particular syntax together. But the important thing is that we, this is what we agreed, and this we can understand from seeing it and from interpreting it by our brain. But the most important thing is that actually we need to transfer this information to the computer so the computer can understand exactly the same thing. So this gives us an indication that basically this line of code, which as an example, add R4, R2, R3, would be at the very end transferred to zeros and ones. And the computer will understand that these zeros and ones, it's not but, doing exactly the same things that you understand or interpret by your brain. And I can have another code with other zeros and ones, which will mean at that particular case that is basically referred to load word R2 comma location. So in each of these cases, I will have a certain instruction and this instruction will be written in a word in that particular case. Another important thing that we would like to highlight that we have basically a risk and CISC in instruction sets. What is risk and CISC refers to and what it exactly means by these things? Risk is a reduced instruction set computers and they have only one word in instructions and require arithmetic operands to be in a gist. This means that each of these lines that we have just seen in the previous slides refers to one command or one instruction, which will be written in only one word. So each line will be written in a word. This is in a RISC process. But not only that, the other restriction that require arithmetic operands to be in registers, meaning but if I have a memory here, this is my memory, and this is my register. For instance, I can't do any operations inside the memory. I can't ask the memory, please take this location, added with this location and put the results in this location. Unfortunately, I can't do that. This is a restriction of the RISC processor or the RISC instruction. If I would like to do that, what I need to do is to copy all of this information to my register, do the arithmetic operation there, put the results there, and then move it back to the memory, meaning that in this particular case, I would move this to that 
particular place, for instance. I will move this to that particular place, for instance. I will do the addition here, put the results in this particular location. And after I have it, I will copy it to a certain location here, or maybe here, whatever like I have decided to allocate this information by doing something called store word. So store word is going from here to here. Load word is going from here to here. Load word meaning load words from the memory to the register. Store word meaning store a certain word from the register to the memory. So we have two restrictions with risk. First, that one command or one instruction will be written in one word. Second, that I cannot do any arithmetic operation inside the memory. There are some restrictions. The other options is complex instruction set computer, which is CISC, have multiple word instructions and allow operands directly from memory. Meaning I can actually have multi word instructions. I can write a certain instruction in multi word. Yes, it's not only one word. I can write that in multi word. But not only that, I can also make these operations, what I just mentioned here, in the memory directly. Take this location, add it with the other location, put the results in a third location. Or maybe to overwrite one of these locations directly. It's not a problem. In risk of processor, on a risk of instruction, I can't do that. And by the way, whatever I am following in this course is a risk of processor or a risk instruction, or the MIPS is basically a risk instruction. So with this risk, of course, is a simpler and it can uh, 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 interact with the memory with only load and store architecture, meaning that I will be able to interact with the memory with only two command or two instructions, load or store. Load, I will go to retrieve information from the memory or read. Store, I would like to send information to the memory or I will write. This will be only the two operations that I can do if I would like to access the memory in a risk instruction set. As I told you, we have the MIPS family which has been one of the most successful in its class. Uh, in, in 1986, basically the first MIPS CPU was announced. And interestingly, over the years, MIPS processors have been used in general purpose computers and also MIPS architecture now offering 32 and 64 bit version. But we will just stick to the 32 bits unless otherwise specified in the uh, uh, assignments or quiz or exams. So again, the MIPS is was first RISC microprocessor, and of course, it was designed uh, that to uh, interact with the memory by just using a load and uh, store uh, instructions. And then in the MIPS, of course, the registers will keep the bus traffic as minimum as possible. Also, there is an important uh, uh, arithmetic operation that we need to understand how we can do that. So if I would like to do an arithmetic operation, I need to uh, represent or indicate three operands. So let's say I would like to add, so I have to have three operands, one, two, three, A comma B comma C. And as we explained that this means that I will take B plus C, and then put the results in A. And this is the syntax that we should have already understood. And we agreed moving forward that this basically will be the stuff. If I say this sub, so basically it will be B minus C and then put the results in A and so on and so forth. Let's take that example. Assuming that I have a higher level language code that actually is like that F is equal to G plus H minus I plus J. And I would like to see how I can write this in assembly because as you know, in a high level language, we really don't care about that. But with assembly, with this particular course, we need to dive in inside the hardware 
to see how we can actually present the stuff. So we need to know how I can translate a higher level language to assembly and vice versa as well. In this case, one may, might say that, okay, I will take the I plus J, I will add them together and then allocate the results in a temporary register called T0. I will take the G and H, allocate the results in a temporary register called T1, and then I will subtract T0 of T1 and then put the results in F. And this is what exactly I did. Add T0 comma G comma H, meaning that I'm adding G plus H, and then put the results T0. This is what we mentioned. Add T1 comma I comma J, add both of these things, put the results in T1, and this is what we just mentioned. And then subtract F comma T0 comma T1, meaning subtracting T1 from T0, put the results in F, and this is what we just mentioned, that we'll have T1 minus T0, and then we'll put the results in F. But this is still not enough. We need to understand more and dive in more in the details on how to represent that in details inside the register. But before we go to move forward to understand more, we need to understand a couple of important things in that register. So again, here is my register. This register size is basically 32 by 32, meaning that this is actually 32 bits and this is actually 32 rows. So it is from zero all the way till 31. So this box or register is 32 by 32, 32 bits by 32 rows. Not only that, I will have some names like T0, T1, all these T9, refer to that to temporary values, S0, S1, all the way to S7 for saved variables and also other register names. Meaning that the designers of the MIPS, they have decided instead of referring to the addresses of their registers as a numbers, they will refer to them as letters. So I will have these numbers from this number to that number is T0 to T9 to T9. This number to this number is S0 to S7. This number to this number is A0 to A4. This number, this number is V0 and V1 and so on and so forth. But the next question, so would you like us to remember how each one referred to which one? Of course not. In the quiz or in the exam, I will give you a sheet with which one is referring to which address and so on and so forth. Then you will understand this kind of thing. So given that we understand these kind of things like that, and we would like to write the exact same code, that F is equal to G plus H minus I plus G given now that we know that there are some T's which, call, which refer to as temporary registers and the S referred as saved registers. And I'm telling you also that variables F all the way to J, G, H, I, and J, and so on, are actually in these registers from S0 to S4, meaning that actually variable F is in register S0. This is in register S1. This is, is in register S2. This is, is in register S3. And this is in register S4. The dollar sign before that is just means that this is a register. That's all. And we will keep referring to that till the end of the semester. So this means that basically I would like to add I plus J. So this means that I would like to add S3 plus S4. And this S3 plus S4, I can put the results in a temporary register called T0 for NS. So I would write add T0 comma S1 comma S2. Uh, sorry, this is will be in T1 and this is will be in T0. So I would like to add S1 to S2 and put the results in T0 and this is what I have in this line. 
If I would like to do this, I would like to add S3 by S4, put the results in T1, add S3 and S4, put the results in T1. After having both of these, please subtract T1 from T0 and then put the results in S0. Subtract T1 from T0 and then put the results in S0. And this is what exactly what I have done to implement the higher level language code that you can see above. So if I'm giving you this, you can actually retrieve that. If I'm giving you this, you can write that. So with this memory operands, that the main memory of course used for composite data, it can have arrays, instructions and dynamic data. In order to access the memory, I can do like a load or a store. As we mentioned, the memory is byte addressable, so I can actually address a byte. And in the MIPS, we are following the uh, big Indian as we have indicated. And since we have, uh, a, uh, we have a forward with 32 bits and a byte of eight bits, so of course the addresses will be a multiple of four as we have already shown. 